Uh, my field of research is geographic information science. And as Deborah said, it's the field that's concerned with how we acquire knowledge or meaning from data that are arrayed in space and in time. Uh, actually, more specifically, I'm in the business of developing software, the research of developing software uh, for analyzing geographic data. And that may be called variously either a geographic information system if the intended uh, data that's applied to it is geographic or map-like in form, or it might be called an image processing system if it comes more in the nature of remotely sensed imagery. I don't make the distinction. I consider them both part of the same field. But as she said, uh, traditionally uh, what geographers have done in trying to understand phenomena is to look for pattern and to use these analogs to real space. So they're little miniature Earths in which we then symbolize the features that are of importance to us. In this case, then uh, simply taking different land cover types, giving them different colors, and it gives us a chance to kind of appreciate uh, their pattern in space. But the technology of GIS and that's the abbreviation and remote sensing uh, allows us to look for pattern in many new ways, not just relying upon our visual system. So I'm going to talk tonight uh, with a few slides about uh, some developments that we made in what's called the Earth Trends Modeler, a tool set specifically designed for looking at Earth observation data. This is satellite data, it's image data that's collected repeatedly over time in a regular time interval, depending upon the system, maybe daily, maybe monthly, and so on. And uh, it refers to a wide range of satellite platforms and their instruments that are designed by NASA uh, and their counterparts in, in other countries as part of what's called the Earth Observing System. These systems gather data in this basic form, a space-time cube. So you have the traditional image dimensions of X and Y, but then you also have time. And this is the key element for this kind of data because it provides us a chance to look at the evolution of Earth system phenomena. So I'm going to show you a few of the ways in which I analyze these kinds of data for pattern. This is probably the simplest uh, of all of the procedures. It's called temporal profiling. Uh, in this case, I've taken a series of uh, about 30 years of monthly vegetation index data. These are images that give us a sense of the amount of photosynthetic activity that's happening at different locations on the Earth's surface. And in this particular illustration, I've zoomed in on Massachusetts. And even more specifically, I have, with this little circular sampling tool, defined an area of interest in southeast Massachusetts. And uh, using this little profiling tool, I've said, give me a profile of all the pixels inside of that circle and show me what's happening to vegetation condition. Actually, more specifically, the anomalies in vegetation condition. It takes only about three or four seconds, and then out pops a little graph that you can see right here. I have time on my x-axis starting in 1982 up to, actually I think this data set goes up to 2004. And then on my y-axis I have anomalies in the vegetation condition. Actually it's sort of the productivity of the vegetation. What's interesting here to look at is the fact that it's not steady over time. Uh, the seasons, by the way, have been removed. So you don't see winter, summer. These are anomaly data. But there are some very big differences <coughs> over time. When I looked at this with my students for the first time, we thought, well, I wonder what that relates to. And so we talked about it and thought, well, maybe it has to do with the ocean temperatures off the coast. Well, one of the nice things here is that I can click this little button here and save that as a one-dimensional time series and then correlate that to other data sets. And so here I've taken a quarter century of sea surface temperature data, also on a monthly time scale, also in the form of anomalies in sea surface temperature, and I've asked it at every pixel location in the ocean to correlate the trajectory over time of sea surface temperature with my anomalies in vegetation. And to our surprise, the area that had the highest correlation, that's the red colors here, were the areas uh, in the Atlantic off of the Canary Islands. We had no idea what caused that when we looked at it. Uh, for the longest time, we simply called it the Cranberry-Canary connection because we had no idea what would relate temperatures in the ocean in the Canaries to vegetation in the, in the southern uh, portion of Massachusetts. But now, if I look at uh, a little bit more complex tool, uh, perhaps I find an answer. 
So this is a very different kind of technique. It's called spectral decomposition. Uh, it is not a simple process. It's quite a complex one. But the technique is designed to look for patterns. This is all about patterns. And so in this case, uh, what I'm asking it to do is to find the first and strongest and most dominant pattern that occurs across time. And the pattern that it finds is displayed in this graph here. Again, time is on the x-axis. It starts in 1982 up to about present. And then you have anomalies uh, in sea surface temperature on the y-axis. And here, if this is its temporal portrait, here you have the spatial portrait. And you can see this very big anomaly in the central Pacific. Many of you probably know what that is. That's the El Nino phenomenon, also known as La Nina, when it goes into its cool phase. So this analysis says the biggest thing that's happening in the ocean, absolutely the biggest over time, is El Nino. Well, what this technique then does is it removes El Nino from every single pixel in the image so that it can continue the process and now look for the second most dominant pattern. And so in this case, now El Nino is removed, the next biggest pattern it finds it temporally it looks like this, a huge trend. Notice the large warming in the Atlantic. This is something called the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. It's about a 60 or 70 year cycle, it's a huge one, and we happen to be right at the peak of this particular cycle. There's probably also a global warming signal mixed up in here. You can notice that actually most of the Earth's oceans are actually pretty heavily involved. In any case, it's like peeling an onion. We search, we remove. Search, remove. Find a pattern, get rid of it. Find a pattern, get rid of it. And go down deeper and deeper into the data as a form of data mining. If I continue this process after I peel away eight levels of the onion and get down to the ninth level, Lo and behold, I find this pattern over time and this pattern over space, and there I have my Canary Islands again. Uh, the Canary Current is actually a very important current. It's a cold current. It's part of this whole gyre here in the Atlantic, the subtropical gyre. And so uh, it would appear that, but I don't know for certain, that what we're seeing in Massachusetts in our vegetation may in fact relate to this very large cycle in the Atlantic Ocean. I search for pattern in order to understand causality. Now, in some cases, as in that one, that uses a well-known concept. It's so well-known, it's been around since at least the early part of the 19th, uh, pardon me, 20th century. Um, but in sometimes when we're working with these data sets, we have to develop new data sets, uh, pardon me, new procedures uh, from scratch. So one of the things that's been of particular in interest lately uh, is phenology. Uh, plant phenology or ve is <coughs> of critical importance because of its role in species survival. And it's also been of interest because it can be a fine indicator of climate change. However, it's a very difficult thing to monitor because of short-term noise and interannual variability. And so we had to develop a whole new procedure for this. And our technique was to actually rely upon the basic technology uh, that goes into noise-canceling headphones. Uh, the technique is called Fourier analysis, and we go through two stages here. In the first stage, we use Fourier analysis to break down a complex signal into a series of regular sinusoidal forms. And then based upon those, we can then describe the shape of the seasonal curve, the progression of the vegetation over the course of the season, using a few select curves that can describe that in a very generalized fashion. And in doing so, we can, we can reject the noise that's involved, for example, with cloud cover uh, as a common contaminant. Then in the second stage, we end up with actually five parameters uh, that describe the shape of this curve. We then look at long-term trends in those five parameters. And there are, as it turns out, three parameters in particular that are of special importance, which is fortunate because we can then color those three trend maps uh, in the three parameters in red, green, and blue, and thereby produce a color composite. Now, this color composite portrays trends in seasonality. The critical color here is gray. If you see gray, it means there's no trend. It doesn't mean there's no seasonality, it just means there's no trend. There may actually be quite strong seasonality, but one of the things you'll notice is that there's very few areas of the Earth that are gray. They're mostly in the desert areas. 
So all these areas that you see in color here actually are changing the character of their seasonality. That's pretty dramatic. Now, we actually tried to make a legend to explain what the heck this thing is portraying and found that even if you had a legend, it's kind of meaningless. So I might look at a color, find it over here in the legend. It says, well, the phase of the annual signal is shortening. The phase of the semi-annual signal is lengthening. The amplitude of the annual signal is increasing while the amplitude of the semi-annual signal is decreasing. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> so we developed then an interactive legend that allows you to actually say, what does this mean? So how am I using this? I'm going to use this map with my eyes to look for areas of common pattern. So I noticed that Western Europe, for example, all has this kind of magenta color here. So I've just picked out an area of interest in Germany. And by delineating that region, it then draws out this little legend. Along this axis, I have January through December. It's the year. The y-axis is uh, a measure of the level of productivity of vegetation. And then I have two graphs. The green one represents the beginning of the series, 1982. And the red one represents the end of the series, in this particular case, 2007. And what you can see here, obviously, you see the progression from winter through spring up to the full peak of productivity in the summer and then senescence in the autumn. But if you look at the difference in the two lines, we see that there is consistently increasing productivity throughout the winter and the spring. <coughs> get into summer, you actually see a bit of depression in productivity. And then if we get into the autumn, you can see an extension of the autumn. Each of these vertical lines represents a month. So if you actually look sideways here, you can see that in Europe, spring is coming about a month early over this time period. Now, go back to our neck of the woods here. I've circled here a nice uniform area of color. I'm using my eyes for that, right? And uh, so I've got central Massachusetts, central Connecticut. And I look at that, and I thought, go, oh, gosh. <laughs> Actually, I kind of know this. Our springs just are not warming up. Um, and it would appear that that's exactly the case here. But we do see an extension of the autumn. And today is kind of an extreme example. But uh, if you look at weather records in New England, this I uh, combined all the, the NOAA weather stations across New England, averaged them. And so here are the average March values uh, since the early 1980s. You can see that March has not changed at all. But if you look at the autumn, this is September. You can see that September has been getting warmer and warmer. So it would appear then that the plants are responding to changes in climate. But they're different in different places. It's not a simple uniform warming up. However, if I widen my view out, you can see here lots of different patterns. Look at this kind of palette knife going on up in here. It's actually more dramatic if you could see it on the proper screen. But uh, all that's, by the way, is, is uh, caused by uh, toilet paper and, um, and paper towels. All right, That's the success of cutting down a forest and then the regrowth of the forest. But uh, this caught my eye. Uh, I've got a light blue area throughout the Midwest. Um, Going from the Corn Belt, here we are in Nebraska. Actually, I've sampled that area. Going down into the Cotton Belt here in Texas. And uh, if I look at what's going on using my sampling tool in Nebraska, I see this very interesting pattern uh, over time now. This gives me the space. Now I look at time. I can see this huge increase in productivity midsummer. Huge. And I also see a difference in the shape, which almost suggests that there's a difference in crop. But that doesn't make sense. Nebraska's corn country. It's been corn country forever, right? And this is cotton country. And it's been cotton country for a long time. So what's going on? Well, this area up in here is the St. Lawrence River Valley. It's got the same color. Uh, I know this area. I was born in Montreal. My daughter studies in Montreal. And so my wife and I travel up through here quite often. And initially, I couldn't figure out what it was. It just didn't look any different. It's a very rich agricultural area. But then I started to notice that uh, all the farms had these little experimental plots. And if you look at these signs and read them, they'll say Monsanto, Pioneer. They're testing out different varieties of grains uh, from some very big agricultural companies. Uh, these farms all have very expensive drying equipment that's associated with feed grains. And then I looked at this field here, and I thought, wait a minute. Something's wrong. I've never seen this before, and I grew up in this region. That's soy. Soy never grew in Canada before. 
this is a new variety of soy that's been designed to work uh, for short periods, short growing seasons. Uh, but the key distinguishing characteristic here is if you look at that field of soy, there's no furrows. You don't need furrows because you don't need to weed. If you want to weed, you just spray it with insecticide. It kills everything, herbicide, pardon me, kills everything except that crop, which is tolerant to it. Um, if you look at this graph here, this is for the US as a, as a whole, you can see that soy, for example, we're getting close to 100% of soy in the US being produced with genetically modified crops. So this is interesting. A pattern I see visually in space in the Midwest catches my eye. I look at the pattern in time it catches my eye because there's something unusual. And what I find is this is a very traditional crop or group of crops, and yet they're very different in the character. So you can see then it's all about pattern, looking for pattern. This is the key to what I do in the software that I create. We can look at patterns over time. We can look at patterns over space. And it often depends just on how I organize the data. So here's my space-time cube. If I think of that as a set of images like a stack of pancakes, I will be typically analyzing that, looking for spatial patterns. If, however, I organize it so that it's like a set of profiles across time at each pixel, then my organization is very different and I will be analyzing across time. So here, for example, I see one data set. <coughs> this is lower tropospheric temperatures past quarter century or so. Uh, and uh, in the top image here, I've analyzed it over time and said, what's the biggest pattern you find? And in the bottom one, I've said, what's the biggest pattern you find looking just at pattern in space? In space, what I find is a pattern that's very coherent spatially and it's very chaotic in time. This is the North Atlantic Oscillation. Actually, it's really, it's a better portrait of uh, its close relative, the Arctic Oscillation which strongly dictates our weather here on the east, east Coast. This pattern, which I could only see when I analyze over time, is a completely different phenomenon. Uh, it's a tr pan-tropical uh, uh, phenomenon that propagates the effects of ocean warming, like El Nino, like the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, globally throughout the tropics. So different patterns, different techniques, but pattern is really the key thing that I'm looking for in the kinds of analyses that I do. So I'll leave it there and pass it over to Eve. All right, I have a lot of images to show you. And uh, the first group of them, I wanted to give you a context um, for my work. I um, have been uh, interested in the correlation between art and science for, for decades and uh, started out as an undergraduate in the sciences and quickly became um, captivated by the history of science and its relationship to the history of art because I see them as just parallel histories of ideas and problem solving. So you'll see here uh, some alchemical engravings that uh, inspired me when I received a um, residency to work with some glass blowers inspired me to um, to look back to these engravings and uh, come up with these um, two three hundred some uh, uh, hand blown uh, glass vessels the name of the piece is apparatus for the distillation of vague intuitions mm -hmm. and it has to do with approximation and error and how approximation and error are things that do exist in both the arts and sciences. Although it's, artists are, 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 are more liberated to, um, in terms of being able to use error in their work. And so there's a subtext in this, uh, in that the, the entire installation is like a three-dimensional poem. There are words that are uh, engraved on these vessels. And then um, during the three month period that I worked with uh, these wonderful glass blowers, um, I started thinking about 
how knowledge is something that's not up in our forebrain, how knowledge is something that's in every single cell in our bodies, and working with these skilled craftsmen, the, the knowledge that was in their, their lungs and in their, in their hands. And so I, over the three month period, I used this rag to wipe the sweat from all of us, and then I boiled the rag, and that residue in the center is the salt of their sweat. So it's a kind of um, <coughs> distillation of the intelligence of the body. This was a project that I did here back in 1999, where I was looking at the history of um, the computer and of digital culture by way of the decorative and performing arts. And it, um, it, uh, this interest started when I saw a jacquard loom from 1801 in a museum and noticed that it used these punch cards, very much like the punch cards I used to play with when my mother worked for um, 3M. She'd bring them home. And uh, how those punch cards were what um, actually programmed the loom to pick up a particular color of thread. And uh, so it's either a zero or a one. So working with a contemporary uh, jacquard weaving mill, I, um, I had this fabric woven, a brocade fabric that tells the story of, um, of uh, digital history and this, the, the history of the computer by way of the decorative uh, arts. Um, I also had an opportunity to, to really peruse the MIT archive and was fascinated with this image of this ant um, touching these tiny little ring-shaped magnets. And the early memory cores from early um, uh, 20th century computers were also woven structures. And uh, ladies would weave these things using very long, very long needles. Um, another way that I work with science, I, I, do, I sometimes do this work that's more fictionally based. I was asked to do a project about Darwin, and I started rereading Darwin and was really captivated with how poetic his language was. He was a beautiful, beautiful writer, and I had forgotten that. And I also was interested how in the latter part of his life, he became interested in metaphysics and would attend seances to try to speak to his dead daughter. So I invented uh, the three lost notebooks of Charles Darwin and uh, using the same format as his field notebooks. And they were um, the dreams of the plants, the memories of the stones, and the awareness of the cells. And then I made these magic lanterns that um, played videos that uh, this one is the memory of the stones. So what you see in this, this um, video is um, supposedly the um, memories that are being extracted from this ammonite. So it's, a, it's an animal that is now a mineral or, or a, a stone, and this device is extracting its memories. And so I'll show you a very quick clip of a little bit about um, this is what rocks remember. So this is what was playing on those little um, uh, magic lanterns. And I'll move on. Um, this one is the awareness of the cells. And this is the biodiversity recombinatory machine. Using the tropes of the history museum, I um, uh, uh, made text that um, uh, corresponded to these fictional devices. And this is the awareness of the cells, a little video clip from the awareness of the cells. Okay, and then this last one is um, the dreams of plants. And where this came from is in um, the uh, chapter in one of Darwin's books on the movement of, that's called The Power of Movement of Plants. There's a chapter called The Sleep of Leaves. It's about how leaves sometimes fold up at night. And I thought, well, if leaves sleep, maybe they dream. And that, that was what really initiated um, this project. So this is, what, um, this is what plants dream. They sort of dream of the magnetosphere of the earth. And, electromagnetic things. 
And then this is just the work in progress. I love to do research. I do a lot of research before I start a piece. Um, I was asked to do something at Wave Hill about the Hudson River. And I thought, oh, that's boring. You know, So many artists have done work about the Hudson River. But I became captivated with a site that was about a mile from the gallery, which was the sugar factory. And I read about, a, um, about the Hudson River being dredged in front of the sugar factory so that boats um, could dock again at the, this birthing area. There was a, so much sediment from um, the sugar and syrup that combined <coughs> with the sediments of the river that boats could no longer dock there. So I partnered with a, a marine geologist and some of his uh, graduate uh, students um, from S uh, Stony Brook. And uh, they were working on a project doing benthic maps of uh, the floor of the Hudson River. One of the things I'm interested in is seeing the unseeable. And uh, this allowed me uh, to work with them and their multi-beam uh, acoustic scanning. And I said, I want to scan this particular area of the Hudson River to show people what this dredge canal looks like. So it's kind of an earthwork in reverse. And what the irony, sort of the deep irony of this is, is that um, you know the Army Corps of Engineers um, dredged it before the full environmental study could be done. And as it turned out, this um, sugar mud um, uh, had a lot of residue from the GE um, spill of PCBs and dioxins. <laughs> So it was contaminated material, which was then used to remediate a more contaminated place in um, the New York Harbor. Um, then back in 1980 is when I got very interested in these atomic legacy sites. I was living in Albuquerque. Right out of graduate school, I moved to New Mexico. Reading the newspaper, found out about the Church Rock uranium mill spill that happened three months after um, Three Mile Island. And you know, there's a lot of um, uranium deposits out west. And um, anyways, this, this uh, spill happened on the Navajo Res, and nobody heard about it. And um, so it went on for months, millions of gallons pouring into the Rio Puerco River. Women who were herding their sheep across the river started getting sores on their legs that wouldn't heal. And then you started seeing birth defects. And then you started seeing cancer clusters in, um, in these specific populations. So I then started zeroing in on other sites in the American West, um, for example, Los Alamos National Labs, where uh, radioactive waste um, for decades, since 1949, has been buried in unlined pits. Um, and as erosion patterns change, you know, there's a lot of wildfires that happen out there. As erosion patterns change, these contaminants flow into the arroyos and then into the Rio Grande and impact upon a number of uh, the Pueblo lands, indigenous uh, people's lands. So this is a project about that, which resulted in a, a Western. So kind of capturing the trope of the Western um, uh, film. And then got involved with the Laguna Pueblo, um, where the Jack Pile mine, uranium mine, which was the largest um, open pit uranium mine in the world, it's now closed. But to give you a sense of scale, all of this terraced landscape, that's the mine. And that little cluster that you see there in the upper left, that's the village of Puade. So it's completely surrounded by the land. The soil, as well as the water on the Laguna Pueblo has been, um, and the aquifer beneath it, has been contaminated with um, radioactive isotopes. And um, so part of this project involved meeting some of these retired miners, gathering their stories, um, looking at these spaces. The Laguna um, sued the um, American government, the US government, also the Anaconda Mining uh, uh, Corporation. And the Pueblo did the reclamation of the mine itself. 
So um, what is unfortunate is that that water, those water resources, it's um, uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to um, clean up an aquifer. So working again with this theme, I had an opportunity to work with Emory University. Um, and I was captivated with the proximity to the Center for Disease Control and wanted to sort of grab them as my audience. So I made this work called Halfway to Invisible about this invisible contamination. Um, this was a kinetic sculpture. There was a big um, video installation. It was a close-up of a cell in uranal acetate solution. So you're sort of seeing the, the uh, genetic, genetic material breaking off of that cell. And there were video sculptures, light boxes that um, uh, told this story of this unseen contamination. Then there was an area that's um, about uh, some possible remediation ideas for sites like this and um, worked with a soil scientist in, um, at Penn State. Then a, 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 another Western um, project has to do with the former Atlas uh, uranium mill right outside of Arches National Park. How are we doing on time? Oh, OK. Um, uh, Arches National Park, um, right next to this um, uh, uranium mill that has been uh, um, leaking uh, radioactive waste into the Colorado River. So I, um, I decided to use the National Park itself as a distribution device for a public service brochure based on the National Park's brochure that I distributed through the bookstore. I just sort of plopped them in there along with the arches uh, ones. And I've done that for a number of other um, things. And I'm just going to quickly talk about this project, because this is where I think that uh, Ron and I really overlap. I did a project about the Fernald uranium production plant that um, uh, was located uh, just outside of Cincinnati. And um, it's closed now. And uh, the groundwater beneath uh, the site has been um, contaminated with various um, radioactive isotopes. This is it when it was being cleaned up. And so the Great Miami Aquifer has this plume that's about 1.5 miles by 1.8 miles underground. And it is moving. And one of the things that I am wanting to do is find ways of um, visualizing how that contamination, and this is just a morphological similarity, um, how this um, contamination is moving underground over time. So I worked with a young um, PhD student, Kalyan Thokala, and we used data from the Department of Energy's um, geospatial um, uh, website. And it's hard to do data mining. You know, everything's all codified in the Department of Energy and Department of Defense and Army Corps of Engineers. But we were able to get data from various test wells um, beneath um, uh, Fernald and do a very simple kind of visualization. That's the kind of visualization that I'd like to be able to do where this plume could be mapped over time and with various other um, uh, information, like if, if climate changes in a certain way where, let's say, there's two inches more of rainfall, how will this affect the plume? If there is less rainfall, how will this in, um, affect the plume? So also doing some um, uh, you know, uh, various ways of looking at the soil permeability and aquifer um, uh, structure. And so I'm just going to end. I'm going to show you a little bit of a video that is um, part of that. The waste from Fernald was shipped out to Texas, Utah, New Mexico, and Nevada. And this is a, just a very simple um, video that um, shows the uranium decay cycle. So I have more stuff to show, but I think I'm out of time. <coughs> OK, thank you. 
Yeah, I guess to start off with a, an observation, um, I'd made some notes before coming here, but some things that I saw as commonalities, and I picked up on the same thing that you did, which is that we both seem to have an interest in making visible the, the invisible. Yes. And uh, one of the things that strikes me about the things that I work on is often I don't know what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. So you may have had a sense of that when I'm, when I'm looking, I'm actually trying to get at particular kinds of patterns that have certain characteristics. So that sequence where I showed um, El Nino followed by the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation and so on. And, um, that was sort of a problematic thing as to how to see patterns and not have them be mixed. So I knew that much. I knew that I wanted the patterns to be not sort of aggregates of more than one pattern. Mm -hmm. And there's sort of ways in which you can begin to understand that, but it's difficult. But I didn't know what I was looking for. Right, and, and uh, I don't know whether you the break in the pattern. Like when you did the the uh, project uh, at the Fernal Green Wash, did you know what you were looking for, or how did you go about that? I, um, you know, I was invited by the University of Akron, and I started doing um, uh, research on these various atomic legacy sites in Ohio, and there's there's a number of them. I think there's five of them. And um, Fernald was an extreme case, you know. It's like Rocky Flats and Hanford and um, Savannah uh, River, uh, in that it's it's sort of a problem that can't be solved. And uh, um, you know, the Department of Energy says 2025 we're going to have this aquifer um, cleaned up, but in the meantime. I think it's critical to know what's happening with that underground plume that we can't see. And yet core samples can be taken and well samples can be taken. And so what I'm, I'm interested in doing is constructing a pattern from that data and constructing a visualization um, over time. But I'm, I'm reminded hearing you speak about um, <coughs> Uh, how you look for patterns. I'm reminded of a series of, of drawings that I did on, a long time ago, charcoal drawings on maps, where I would look at a map and look for one pattern. And sometimes on a topo map, it would be trailer parks, or it would be borrow pits from mining. And I would use charcoal, and I would erase everything except this one pattern of information. And they look like star charts. They're all black with these little white dots. So it's a similar kind yeah, of editing system. It's like you have to edit to be able to understand. And then you can let go of the edit and look again. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of a process of filtering. Progressively filtering out what you don't want in order to get what you do want. Yes. That was the thing with the seasonal trends analysis was that um, I knew what the problem was that people were having in getting at that information. Short-term noise was a problem. I needed to figure out how to get rid of that. And I also needed how to, to get rid of that interannual stuff, the stuff that happens over five, ten years that really doesn't matter because it'll change one way and then another. How to get at that long sequence. And so you, you whittle away and you think, well, if I do this, I can get rid of that portion. Mm -hmm. Now I'm left with this. Now how do I'm, I going to get rid of the other portion? And you gradually try to move through these things until you get what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. But it's a um, it's a it's a it's a process of successive approximations in many cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I was really taken with the um, the gorgeousness, sort of the lavishness of of um, of your maps and your visualizations and and. Uh, how um, it, it wants us to seek out the meaning in them because they are so visually compelling, which I think is, is something that, that um, artists who work with um, um, complex content are also trying to do. You know, how do you lure someone in so that they, they have a sense of the history of a place like Fernald? You know, it's almost like you have to sort of seduce them with the, these, um, you know, these materi the materiality. 
Interesting. So I had a sense that you have a fascination with instruments. Am I yes, right? Yes, <laughs> and hardware. <laughs> I, do, I do too. Uh, yeah. So, so tell me about mm -hmm. uh, dowsing rods. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, before I tell you about dowsing rods, I want to tell you about something I did when I was a little girl and I got a lot, in a lot of trouble for doing it. You know, I was, I was raised in a single parent home, so my mother was never at home during, you know, the day when I would get off of school. And I took apart my grandfather's pocket watch because <laughs> I wanted to see all those little gears inside. And I was so delighted. I had them all laid out on the dining room table. It's like, Mom, look what I did. <laughs> So there is that thing of wanting to kind of explode something to be able to understand, you know, time, <coughs> something yeah. like time. But dowsing rods, yes, I, I did a project um, in which I taught myself how to douse for water, the traditional method of um, looking for water that is kind of a cross-cultural and global phenomenon, and I was kind of skeptical. I didn't know, is this woo-woo, you know, new age, or is this really something, is there really something here? So I'd get up very early in the morning, and I would walk around Williamsburg and Greenpoint, Brooklyn, with my dowsing rods at like five, six in the morning, because I didn't want anyone to see me and think, oh, there's that crazy lady with the dowsing rods. <laughs> and every time they would cross, I would make a mark on a map. And I did this for a number of weeks and had my map with all these marks on it. Then I went to the Library of Congress in DC and I had made an appointment with them to look at old maps of um, that area of Brooklyn to see where the historical waterways, the, you know, the springs were and the creeks uh, that are now all landfilled. And it was sort of uncanny so I don't know what to think about it. I do have a, a, a skeptical edge to me, but I also have an openness that, you know, maybe mm. there is something here. I know that the Germans and the Japanese have written some serious uh, scientific papers on the phenomenon, so, yeah. I'm always intrigued by, um, I work in the Earth's system science field, so, uh, I show this constellation of satellites, and they, many of them will have multiple instruments, but the ingenuity of Earth system scientists in getting information is intriguing. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of slides. Is it possible that yes. we're still let on your just, computer, right? Uh, so. Yeah, let me close out of this. <coughs> and uh, and get yours up. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Great. And... I'm going to do this without my glasses. This could be... Do you want your glasses? No, that's all right. Okay. <laughs> what I need is an education in a Mac. <laughs> <laughs> and me for a PC. <sighs> I just need to go across here. And... Well, while you're looking for your slide, I just have to tell you I have a fascination with space junk and orbital debris and, uh, um, and was curious if there are ways in which orbital de debris is being mapped. Oh, I don't know, actually. Oh, great. Great. I see. Okay, so this was, this is that same technique I showed you before, where it's looking at trends in the seasonality of vegetation and, and uh, the Indian subcontinent is a very colorful place, but most of them are variants of what you're seeing in the small area that's uh, circled there in white, um, and the graph is on the left, and what you're seeing there is evidence of irrigation. Um, this area has been mined for water like no other place on Earth. Mm. Huge amounts of water. We talk about the Green Revolution, but in many areas of the world, it's really the Blue Revolution that we're seeing here. Now, uh, that's an interesting pattern. Uh, Earth system scientists, how do I click? Do I just click here to get to the next one? Uh, yeah, just the, hit this arrow, little arrow button. That one? Yeah. Let's go for it. Yeah. Right. 
This one is sort of a companion to this, or shed some light on this. This is an instrument, it's totally ingenious. It's two satellites traveling in tandem. And they're a short distance from each other, but they're traveling over the Earth together, and they're constantly measuring the distance between them with a laser. Now, as they move along, their orbit, uh, their orbits get slightly changed by gravity. And so if the gravitational pull is stronger, they'll be pulled closer, and then they'll be farther away if it's a little lighter. And that then gets translated into a measure of the gravitational pull measured in uh, kilograms of water, uh, or actually water equivalent thickness per month. And uh, so this is the same software, so this is a trend you're seeing here. You can see this negative trend in northern India. I circled that, and it's shown then a profile of that trend. And you can see that uh, the gravitational pull is progressively decreasing. And that's literally from the extraction and loss of that water. It's taken out of the ground, goes to the crops, goes up to the atmosphere through evapotranspiration, and is carried off somewhere else. So the scary part of this, of course, is that this is being mined at a rate that's faster than the recharge. So it's a finite resource. It will eventually just completely run out. But that instrument is so ingenious that somebody thought that up. It's like, how are we gonna get a measure of gravitational pull? And then one last, it, 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 yes, yes. And then uh, this is the third one, the last one. Um, most of the Earth resource satellites uh, have a polar orbit, so they go uh, from north to south, and they rotate like this. And of course, you're interested in timing it in conjunction with the sun, so it's in a sun-synchronous orbit. Uh, so they're usually timed so that when they cross the equator, it's about 10.30 in the morning to get a little bit of shadowing, which geologists like. So they're, uh, as they go from north to south, they're all in full sunlight, and they're rotating at the same speed as the sun, then they get around to the other side of the Earth, and it's like, okay, we're in dark now, we'll wait. And, um, you know, 45 minutes later, it'll come around the other side. Uh, some bright spark got the idea of saying, well, let's look at what's going on on the night side. And so the nighttime lights, this actually comes from a military satellite that's very sensitive, uh, are quite intriguing. So this is a time series of the nighttime lights. It's a global image, but I've zoomed in on Europe. And uh, this particular technique measures the degree to which a trend is consistently going up or down. So uh, the red areas are areas where the amount of light that's being emitted at nighttime is increasing, and then the blue areas are the, uh, are the areas that are decreasing in their, in their light. Um, that's free data, nobody designed it, but somebody thought, wait a minute, you know, there's probably some useful information there. And look at this, look at the borders. Look at the border of Poland and its neighbors. During this particular time, Poland went through a 500% increase in their GDP, all right? Presumably that's related to it. Um, I don't know some of these. Look at Northern Ireland versus the Irish Republic. Irish Republic, of course, was going through a huge economic uh, development at that particular time. Look at Russia. This is, of course, the time of the, of the big change in government in Russia. Look at most of the urban areas that are in blue, and then you can look at the suburbs of Moscow and St. Petersburg, which show the red, the increase. Uh, so that's just ingenious. You know, somebody thought of that. And there are many instances like that. Uh, uh, there was a recent case of a satellite instrument that was up for a period of about five years before somebody realized, you know what? Gosh, if we rework the algorithm, I bet you we could detect carbon dioxide, and indeed they can. Um, and that's another case of just being ingenious with what, uh, what's a possible source of information. So, so I like instruments too, but it's a... Uh, we have about five more minutes, and I would love to, for anybody who has a question um, to uh, partake, and uh, to we'll pass around that. Okay. Mike. I like the, um, the dowsing thing, because I think what you're, you're looking for a, more or less an event that's not defined by time or by um, space, the spatial representation. My question is, um, your eyes define the world as space, so you're inclined to look for patterns that are spatially laid out. In time, we experience life as time, so you're inclined to look for events that are next to each other in time. I'm wondering if you find those limitations of our imagination in terms of pattern recognition um, limiting in terms of the tools you're using to find patterns 
and also in your understanding of pattern recognition. I, I, I like, I, again, I like the dousing example because you're, you're opening your mind to in, in, a pattern that isn't defined by time or space, sure, if you okay. understand my question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, and if I could just respond that, um, you know, dousing is fascinating to me because it is such a low-tech um, technique of the body, and that the body is part of the dousing rod and as the body um, moves through space. And this is a kind of a, um, a project where I would um, love to um, collaborate with um, the more high-tech end of um, uh, the spectrum to bring those visualizations um, to the public, but uh, you know I'm there with my little X's on the map. But uh, I would love to take it the next step. Thanks. Thank you. I, I may have misunderstood, maybe not. But one of the things that struck me about your presentation, especially at the beginning, were those videos of memory. Yeah. And the memory of sort of natural objects, natural whatevers, and it, it's it's imperative, I think you know, thinking about not just what these patterns suggest, but also where these patterns come from, and thinking about it metaphorically, and poetically, and, you know, however else you want, you want to uh, uh, describe it. I, this is maybe not a question, it's more of a reaction, uh, but it would, to me, it was hugely important in terms of the entire conversation, you know, between the two of you. Um, so in science, the ideal is often to be um, kind of unbiased, and in art, often when you when it has an agenda, it has a danger of becoming um, propaganda. Both of you are working with things that are very, very critical. One is global warming, and one is um, you know uh, radioactive waste. I wonder if you if you try to keep your work separate. If you guys do try to push for social change, do you make a separation between your work and a push? Is your work enough? You know, just if you could talk about that a little bit, it would be great. Right. Good question. You know, I, um, I often think of my work that has to do with environmental issues as public service announcements. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I seek out opportunities where I'm not just speaking to the art audience. You know, I sort of don't care that much about the galleries and all of that. Um, and I think that it's important to target certain um, audiences that, where information that's being carried by the work is, that, that is re relevant for them. So with the um, National Park brochure, um, ideally if I get funding to do this, I would like to do workshops in those gateway communities that are right in, be in, in between zones um, where atomic legacy sites and the national parks um, mash up uh, together, but I think that, um, you know, artists are free to have a lot of playfulness and play in their work, and, um, and I think that that, that can sometimes um, uh, counter the didacticism of, um, of making work that is heavy in research, you know, that, that, I, that I do try to find ways of, um, of bringing some lightness to it, like in the Darwin piece that was um, uh, mentioned before. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. It's an interesting question. The, um, the group of colleagues and I published a paper a few weeks ago based upon an analysis of the last 30 years of the vegetation archive that I showed you. And uh, we were trying to identify, in general, when you looked at all those trends, and you saw many of them, and I just pointed out a few interesting examples, um, more than half of the Earth's vegetative surfaces are actually going through an increase in productivity. And that is a strange concept. Why would the Earth be greening? And they're greening it's greening in all kinds of areas. After the 1980s and so much discussion about desertification, 
Even in dry land areas, we seem to be going the opposite direction. And so there was a big debate about how we were going to present that particular finding. And um, I felt strongly that we just simply had to report it the way it was, despite the fact that we knew that there would be some who would latch on to that fact and actually use it to their advantage in a, in a po very political debate about climate change. So it's difficult sometimes, but 